Okay, everybody. Uh, our next talk is by uh, Pastor Leon Atkins. We've known each other since 1981-82 when I was teaching Lay Institute classes at Dallas Seminary, the Doctrine of Salvation and the Book of Galatians, and Leon took both courses. Back then he was a sign painter going up on the freeways and the big billboards. He would hand paint the signs. And uh, later he became the pastor at Bree Memorial Church, which is a, a historic free grace church in the Metroplex in Irving, Texas. And so what's your title today? It's on uh, John 6, 37. So let's give him a warm welcome. Good morning. Shall we begin with prayer? Our Father, we come to you with deep gratitude. We're very thankful for GES. It's, uh, it's great to have a remnant of people who believe in grace alone through faith alone. And it's very refreshing to have fellowship one with another. So we want to thank you for this opportunity. And we know that we may have many instructors in your word, but there's only one teacher who is God, the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that we will be very sensitive and very positive to his teaching ministry today. And we pray that all that we do today and all even that we think and we say will be well pleasing to you and edifying for one another in Jesus name. Amen. Well, I uh, am very grateful for Bob's introduction. Uh, Bob and I, as he said, it, we've known each other since the early 80s. And uh, I am extremely thankful for Bob and GES. And I'm thankful for my spiritual heritage. I wandered in off the street uh, in 1972 to a little place called Berean Memorial Church. And I didn't know anything about doctrine. Well, I, I shouldn't say I didn't know anything. I knew that I was saved, and I knew that I was saved by grace alone through faith alone, and I believed in eternal security. And other than that, I had literally been brought up in the church. My dad was a Southern Baptist pastor, and um, I'd read the Bible. I did uh, daily Bible readings like good Baptists do. But somehow, uh, with all the confusion about giving your life to Christ, um, turning your life over to Christ, inviting Jesus into your heart, all that stuff, somehow I had missed the doctrine of salvation by grace alone through faith alone. But at some point, I discovered it. And when I came back to Dallas, I was born in Dallas. My a family moved to Oklahoma to a little town of 500 and I w went from uh, going to a high school where there were several thousand kids enrolled, uh, North Dallas High School, to this little high school in Oklahoma. There were 13 in my graduating class. <laughs> but I really liked it and I liked Oklahoma so much I stayed there about 10 years and uh, then I returned to Dallas. And when I came back to Dallas for a job opportunity, I noticed something really remarkable. It seemed like some of you may remember this, others are, are so young you won't, but it seemed like everywhere I went in Dallas, I would see a big trailer parked without the truck, just the trailer, or a big billboard that would say, thanks Dallas, or thanks everyone for helping OL NIMS make another million. And it seemed like everywhere I went, I would see those. And uh, I learned that O.L. Nims was a millionaire. Back then, that was really a big deal. Nowadays, you have to be a billionaire or a trillionaire for it to be a big deal. But back then, being a millionaire was a big deal. And he made most of his money. He owned several nightclubs. And uh, visiting dignitaries to Dallas, he would try to uh, make arrangements to have his picture taken with them. And uh, he was always uh, very money oriented. And then, now all this that I've told you is true. 
This other part may be true and it may not, may be one of those urban legends that somebody invented and it's gone on, but it's too good a story not to tell. Okay, in 1973, O.L. Nims died. And the story is that he had this brand new Cadillac convertible that he was really proud of. And he wanted to be buried behind the wheel of that convertible. So they took out uh, the big uh, equipment, heavy equipment, and they dug a grave big enough to uh, put a Cadillac convertible in. And as he was being lowered into the grave, top down on the Cadillac, it propped up in the driver's seat of that brand new Cadillac. A couple of the grave dig diggers were watching and one of them said to the other, man, just look at that brand new Cadillac. Wow, that's really living. <laughs> so that tells us something about a popular worldview in those days that if you had lots of money, if you were successful, quote, successful, then you had a life that was real life, which is just the opposite to what the Word of God teaches us. So what we call it today is postmodernism. Now, uh, I'm not real organized on this, and I'll tell you why. We stayed in a hotel that advertised free Wi-Fi and you get what you pay for. And it was free and it was very, uh, I, I was in one of Bob's classes yesterday morning and I kept disappearing and coming back because of the internet. So we have at our church, a church provides for us um, Windows 365 and man, it is great. Uh, you don't have to save anything, it saves it automatically. And, all that kind of stuff. And as long as you have internet, it works great. But uh, I worked on this again yesterday and last night and I tried to save it and it wouldn't save it. It kept telling me this file does not exist. And I thought, well, this is strange. I thought I had, had been sitting here working on it for a couple <laughs> of hours, but they say it doesn't exist. So I wasn't going to start out with postmodernism. I was going to say that nowadays this type of worldview is called postmodernism. But uh, back then, I remember when I was uh, growing up, back in the 50s, it was called modernism. And uh, I actually thought when I was uh, very young, like elementary school, I thought modern was a bad word because modernism meant that you don't really believe the Bible. You don't believe that God created the world in six days. You believe that it just kind of happened in, in Darwinism and uh, the Bible had mistakes in it. So that was modernism. And um, then that was replaced. Uh, I remember uh, back when I was a teenager and a uh, freshman, uh, sophomore in college, it was called existentialism. And what that meant was the best I could figure out, you know, these things are really hard to nail down and to define because they're so fuzzy and so many different definitions. But uh, existentialism was something like the only thing we know for sure is that we exist. And um, if you find something that gives your life meaning and purpose, then grab it and live it. And that makes you an authentic person. Otherwise, you're not an authentic person. So if, if Christianity, if that meets your need, then grab it and go for it and live by it. If, the, if it doesn't, then, hey, try Buddhism or atheism or something that will give your life meaning and purpose. That was what we used to call existentialism. And then it got to be called um, secular humanism. Back in the 80s, you might remember secular humanism. And all of these things basically had the same philosophy. Nowadays it's called postmodernism. And uh, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. We just change the name every few years. <laughs> uh, but they're all basically the same. And uh, what postmodernism says is that absolute truth does not exist. And they're absolutely certain about that. <laughs> uh, and then um, 
I uh, was invited to a pastor's conference at Dallas Theological Seminary. And you know, there was a time, boy, I thought those guys at Dallas Theological Seminary, some of them probably had wings because they were perfect. I mean, they had their doctrine down. Well, that was a myth. It wasn't completely true, but almost back in the 50s, 60s, and even uh, the early 70s. But uh, when, when I got to Dallas Seminary, I was shocked by some of the things I heard. And I was very grateful for my heritage that uh, Dr. John E. Danish was a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary and had sat under the teaching of Lewis Ferry Schaefer personally, and he had his doctrine right. And that was, when I, that was why when I wandered into that church and I heard what I heard, I kept coming back. Because as I say, I didn't know much, but I knew that I was saved, I knew I was saved by grace, and I knew that once I was saved, I could never be unsaved. And I heard Dr. Danish in the early days that I was attending that church say that, and I thought, well, I'm just going to stay here. But uh, Dr. Doctrine was number one at Berean Memorial Church. And uh, I was invited to this pastor's conference a couple of years ago, and the the uh, subject of the conference was uh, how to relate to millennials. And boy, that's something I really have problems with. You know, young people born um, in the last years, the, the previous uh, millennium and uh, since, uh, I really have problems relating to them because they think so much differently than the way I do. So I thought, boy, this is for me. So I went to the conference and I was really surprised because the first thing I was told is as a pastor, if you want a millennial, millennials to come to your church, don't give them information. <laughs> that was a code word for doctrine. He said, if they want to know anything, they can Google it. You want to know about uh, the coming millennium? You want to know about the tribulation? You want to about, know about inerrancy? Just, just Google it and you can find out all you need to know. But don't teach them doctrine in the church because they don't want to hear it. Don't give them information. Give them an experience. Doctrine is not important. What is important is experience, according to that. And... I, I don't know about you, most Christians have had times of doubt. And uh, every once in a while I meet a Christian who said, I've never doubted my salvation, I've never doubted God's promises, never doubted anything. And I think that's great, that's wonderful. But uh, most of us have, we've gone through periods of doubt and uh, we want to change these doubts to belief. You can't doubt something and believe it at the same time. So um, doubt is not something to be honored and glorified and encouraged. But I learned that doubt is really a good thing. You know, uh, some churches were even having doubt nights uh, where people would get up and share their doubts. Oh, wow, yeah, that's a good doubt. Uh, you're, <laughs> that's great. So postmodernism glorifies doubts. Since you can't be sure about anything, then go ahead and doubt it. You, you can be sure, certain that you're doubting. And the main thing about Christianity to postmodernism is that it's all about the here and now. And that's why the mega churches, you know, in the last 20 years, most evangelical churches have suffered a loss. If you have 3,000 members and you lose half of them, you still have a pretty good sized church. Yeah. But if you're like Berean Memorial Church and you had 90 members and you lost half of them, you got 45 people. And most of them are old and can't come to church anymore. So they, uh, that's why uh, the internet is so important. But if you wanna really build a church and attract people, teach health and wealth gospel. I mean, God wants you to be happy. He doesn't want you to have any problems. You know, if you're, if you're sick, if you have any kind of health problems or anything because you don't believe hard enough and you're not a good Christian, so come give us some money and we'll, take, <laughs> we'll teach you how to be prosperous. And the more money you give us, uh, the more money God will give you. I'll tell you what, that works 
for the preacher <laughs> because they're driving around in their Rolls Royces and all that stuff, but it doesn't work for the poor lady on Social Security who's giving more and more of her income. There used to be a member of our church who had worked for one of the big time charismatic preachers on his phone bank. And he was told when somebody calls and says, look, I've been giving money over and over and I haven't gotten anything in return. What's going on? Tell them they're not giving enough money. <laughs> Step out on faith and give more. And the more you give, the more God will give you. So that's the way so many people, this is in the world view now that is popular. Uh, Christianity is about the here and now. And if you can go to a church and leave with a good feeling so that you can face the world on Monday morning, well, it's a good church. Go there. Uh, it's all about the here and now. And um, all of this stuff is, um, like I say, it's, it's not new. There is nothing new under the sun. And Paul, the Apostle Paul saw this. It was called by a different name then, but it was, uh, he said in Romans 1.28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And uh, the reason is they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. There was no place in their worldview for God. So they just kicked God out and said, find meaning. If it feels good, do it, and so on. And God says, okay, if you don't want me in your worldview, then you, you can have the worldview that you have. And Paul went on to say that this was a cover for sin. You know, a kid goes to college, and uh, all the things he's been taught at home, you know, you don't do this, you don't do that. And uh, he goes to a party and somebody offers him a reefer and he smokes a reefer. And uh, then he meets a girl and uh, they commit sexual sin. And he wakes up the next morning and the sun's shining and he said, wow, what I've been taught at home is not true. Here, I'm still living, I feel good. And uh, I've broken all those rules that I've been told not to. And uh, to go back to the Christian worldview, of, of no unrighteousness, no fornication, and all those things that uh, the Bible says would mean that I have to give up all these things that I'm really enjoying. So this is a, a cover, a smoke screen for uh, sin and unrighteousness. And it, incidentally, I know these scriptures look uh, strange to some of you. This, I use the King James Version. I'm not a uh, King James only freak, but uh, it's what I was brought up on. And I love the King James Version. Uh, I remember back in my 20s, I just couldn't wait for a new translation to come out. And uh, I, I would read the newest one for a year, but I always went back to the King James. So I like the King James. And uh, when I first became pastor of the church at uh, Berean Memorial Church, uh, I thought most of the members of the congregation use the NASB. And uh, I thought, well, I I'll use the King James for my own personal study, and then I'll preach from the NASB. And boy, that didn't work. I mean, I spent most of my time trying to explain the differences of the two. So finally, one Sunday morning, I just said, folks, I'm using the King James, and went from there. So I use the King James, and I hope you don't find it too strange. I remember in seminary one night, we were um, supposed to look up scriptures and one of the uh, fellow students hadn't brought his Bible. And I said, well, here, you can borrow mine. He opened it up, started reading and said, what kind of translation is this? <laughs> anyway, if you were thinking that same thing, it's King James. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Zane Hodges, and incidentally, my pastor, Dr. Danish, used to quote J Zane Hodges frequently. And his favorite term for Zane Hodge, Hodges was, he is a gem of a theologian, G-E-M, a gem of a theologian. I don't know if he knew Zane personally or not, but he uh, bragged on Zane frequently. And uh, Zane Hodges was aware of postmodernism. He wrote a couple of articles back in the early days of uh, the GES magazine. 
And uh, one of the things he wrote about postmodernism is that uh, if someone tells you that I know there is no such thing as absolute truth, just ask them, are you absolutely sure of that? <laughs> because they say you can't be certain about anything except, of course, that biblical Christianity is not true. <laughs> so, uh, and it's considered a mark of humility to say, well, you can't know anything for certain. Uh, that's really humble because all these facts in the world, I can't grab one and say, I really know that this is true. That's arrogance, if, if you can say that. So uh, they do admit, I may be wrong about this. Uh, you can't be sure about anything. And yes, I may be wrong about this. And uh, I, I love um, Lewis Berry Schaefer once said, if, somebody, if you're arguing with someone about something and uh, they, they're very adamant about it, just say, is it possible that you could be wrong? Now, if they say, no, it's not possible, I'm absolutely right, uh, then there's no use in continuing the conversation. But most people will have enough humility, either pseudo-humility or genuine humility, to say, uh, yes, I, I could be wrong about that. The next question is, uh, if you are wrong, would you want someone to correct you? And if someone says, no, I've got my own worldview, I don't need anybody telling me I'm wrong, okay, well, go your way. Uh, may God have mercy. <laughs> but if they answer, and most people will say, uh, yes, I would love to be uh, corrected if I'm wrong about something. Then you have something that you can talk about. And it, it's okay to have these philosophical discussions and everything. But the main thing is, as believers, the only source of absolute truth we have about spiritual matters is the Bible. Now think of that, even the atheist, all these atheists that are running around hating God, you know why, if there were a God, I would shake my fist in his face because of all the suffering in the world and blah, blah, blah. They wouldn't even know what kind of God to hate if they didn't know something about the Bible. And, you know, you can just imagine if, if we didn't have the Word of God, if we didn't have the Bible, everybody would be making up a religion of their own. And the word God would be meaningless because we wouldn't know what a God was even supposed to be. So we stick with the word of God because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then as Paul again wrote to this young pastor, uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 13, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard from me. And uh, we, he we hear these from the apostle Paul and the other apostles who wrote the Bible, the prophets and the apostles. So that's what we need to hold fast to, the sound words which we have heard in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Now, here we are at John 6, 37, and that was what, uh, this is what our text is. And I don't know how I'm running here. Is there somebody that will give me a clue every once in a while? Okay, about 15 more minutes. Okay, John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. This is a very special verse for me because as a young Christian, all I knew was that I was saved and it was all by grace and it was for eternity. And uh, I had some doubts. You know, every once in a while I would think, well, how do I know I'm really saved? How, how do I know the Bible is even true? And one day I was thinking about these th thoughts and uh, I had a, I, I like to call it an epiphany. You know, when you get a sudden flash of insight and this epiphany was Jesus said somewhere in the Bible, I know I've heard that Jesus said, him that comes to me, 
I will in no wise cast out. And that means I came to Christ. I came to him in faith and put my faith in him for eternal life. And therefore, now this sounds almost blasphemous. I thought, if I'm not saved, God's a liar. And that's unthinkable. God is the God of truth. And Jesus is God in human flesh. So it would be impossible for Jesus to lie. And so I thought, wow, God is not a liar. So there's no way I could ever, under any circumstances, be unsaved. Now, it's always good when you talk about a, a passage to take it in context. So we'll just go over John 5, uh, the previous chapter Quickly, uh, Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, and you would think people would say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, isn't that a great uh, thing for this man to do? But instead, they decided they'd kill him for it because he did it on the Sabbath. And uh, then Jesus made an important announcement that God the Father had committed all judgment to his son, who was Jesus. And then John 5 ends with a uh, reference, with Jesus making a reference to Moses. He said, um, I shouldn't expect y'all to believe in me. You don't even believe in the writings of Moses. And Moses wrote about me. If you believed Moses, you would believe me. And boy, Moses did write about Jesus. Uh, um, a few years ago, I decided around Christmas time to do a special sermon on uh, Christ in the Old Testament. And so I went through a few, pro few prophecies about Jesus. Next year, I thought I would repeat it, but uh, I couldn't get it all in one sermon. I had to make a couple of sermons. And every year, it just gets longer and longer and longer because I just keep seeing, keep finding references. And I appreciate Philippe's uh, a presentation last night of some of the appearances of the Savior in the Old Testament. And if you were impressed by that, I was too, but there are many more, and we just keep discovering them. Okay, John 6, he started out uh, teaching and uh, fed a multitude of about 5,000 men. And if most of those men were married and brought their wives, that would double that number, and some of them brought uh, three or four or five kids. So we're talking about a whole lot of people, a big crowd of people. And uh, they thought, man, this is great. We got a free meal. <laughs> and uh, this is wonderful. Let's just follow this man around. And he's obviously the Messiah. And he'll take over the government. And he'll put us all on a free meal program. <laughs> so they decided, uh, Jesus said, no, no, it's not time for that. We're not going to do that. Let's talk about other things. And they were going to kidnap him and force him to uh, be king. So he just told his disciples, okay, you fellows get on this boat, go over to the other side, and I'm going to go up on a mountain and spend some time with my father, and I'll see y'all later. And that was when uh, Jesus walked on water, and then Peter walked on water. And when they, they got to shore, there was a big crowd waiting for him to get there. And they were interested in two things, and it wasn't, Lord, tell, teach us more about eternal life. It was, first of all, they wanted to... Uh, Master, how did you get here? Uh, they knew he hadn't come over uh, with it, hadn't gotten on the boat with his disciples, and there he was on the shore, so that was a big thing. And they were also interested in bread. That was a good meal, and it didn't cost us anything. So uh, let's talk about bread. What, what time is lunch going to be today? <laughs> and so Jesus took advantage of that, and he talks about bread. He says, I am the living bread. Um, John 6, 28. I, I love this. They said, what do we have to do to be saved? What do we have to do to do the works of God? And Jesus answered, so plain, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. You want to do something for the Lord? Then start out by believing him. Verse 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. Man, that is satisfying. That the receiving eternal life is satisfying not only for time but for all of eternity. 
And then John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Okay, God the Father in his omniscience knows who's going to be saved, who's going to believe. And so he takes all these people who believe in Christ, who will believe in Christ, and he gives them to his son as a gift. And uh, that's another thing that makes us precious to the Lord Jesus. We are his prized possessions, a gift from his father. So they will come to him, they will believe in him, and under no circumstances will he ever cast them out. Um, I love the way uh, my former pastor, now with the Lord, Dr. John Danish, used to uh, phrase it. He used to say, if you've placed your faith in Christ for eternal life, you're going to heaven. Even if you decide you don't want to go to heaven, God will take you to heaven if he has to pull you in with you kicking and screaming. <laughs> it's something that is totally irreversible. Verse 40, and this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which sees the son and believes on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. Uh, everyone that sees the son. So does that just mean the people who were living then who could actually see Jesus? No, it means us. We, we say when somebody explains something, something we don't understand and they explain it to us, we say, oh, I see. So when you see Jesus, that means understanding who and what he is, the eternally preexistent son of God. Whoever sees the son and once you see him for what he is, you put your faith in him for what he says and what he promises is eternal life to those who believe in him for it. And he that believeth on him may have everlasting life. And boy, when Jesus says everlasting life, you know what he means? <laughs> uh, he means everlasting life. <laughs> it's not something like, well, you're on probation. And if you're a good boy or a good girl, we'll take a look at it when you die. And if you've done a pretty good job of living the way you're supposed to, we'll give you eternal life. If not, boy, you've had it. But he says, I will raise him up at the last day because they have everlasting life. And <clears throat> seeing, everyone that sees the sun, um, that reminds me of John 3.14. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what did you have to do if you were bitten by one of those snakes in the wilderness? You had to look, and anybody could look. All you had to do was just look up at it. And Jesus says, that's the way it is. I am lifted up. He, he was going to be lifted up on the cross, and whoever looks upon him, uh, whoever believes in him, which is the same as looking on him, seeing him, and putting your faith in him, would have eternal life. And again, this, you know, an Old Testament scripture, Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be ye saved, not just Jews, but all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Um, this is the, the passage that Charles Spurgeon was saved under. Now, I know Charles Spurgeon is a controversial uh, person. You read one thing that he says and then you read another. But boy, he had this right. When he was 16 years old, he wandered into a church on a snowy day because he had promised God that he was gonna go to church every Sunday. And uh, the first Sunday of the year, there was a blizzard. And his mom said, Charlie, you're certainly not going out in this. He said, yes, mom, I'm uh, going to church. I promised God. Well, he went to this church, went to that church, went to the other, and they were all closed. And finally, he saw a light in a church building, so he went in there. And there are different versions of the story. One is that he was the only person there. Uh, another is that two or three other people were there. But the janitor of the church had come over and, and uh, lighted the coal oil lamps and made a fire just in case somebody showed up. But the pastor didn't show up. So this janitor said, ye have come to hear a sermon, and a sermon ye shall hear. And he got up and uh, read Isaiah 45, 22, 
and preached an impromptu sermon. Look unto me and be saved. And young Charlie Spurgeon was sitting there with tears coming down his eyes. His father was a preacher. His grandfather was a preacher. He had read all the books in their library. He could talk theology with uh, the PhDs and uh, all the sharp guys. But he realized he had never looked upon the Savior for salvation. And that was a turning point in his life. Isaiah 45, 2. Look unto me and be saved. Back to John 6, 37. All the Father gives me shall come to me. And him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now, the word, the term no wise is translated a lot of different ways. But this is really interesting. In the Greek, it's ume. And that is what they call emphatic negation. And, you know, you can say no in su such a way. Um, as Bob said, I used to paint billboards. And the guys I worked with, they had a lot of fun making fun of me because uh, I was a Christian and all that. But when they wanted, when they had a problem, guess who they came to? And when they wanted somebody to represent them, they came to me. And I thought, man, I don't know how to do this, but you know, God opened doors and I was able to, to do what I, I felt like at time he had called me to do. In fact, I was a, their steward, their union steward. And I have jokingly said that I think it would be good if they would take the guys at Dallas Seminary who want to be pastors and make them go get a job somewhere and be a union steward for a few years. Yeah. Good training for a pastor. But anyway, um, I've sat across the table from big shot executives and I would make a proposal and they would say no. But there was something about the way they said no, and sometimes I could tell by looking at their eyes, they meant no, but changed my mind. I remember uh, they were gonna fire a guy one time, and boy, they were busy. They needed all the help they can get. And so I went over to talk to the boss about it, and he said, no use talking, I'm gonna fire him. But I could tell by something, the way he said it, I said, well, let's talk about it. He said, okay. And I said, well, you know, it's really hard to find uh, good workers. And yeah, he made a mistake, but I think he learned his lesson. Okay, okay, I won't, uh, I won't fire him. So that, that's one way of saying no. No, but talk to me about it. There's another way, and that's when these two words, ooh and may, are together. That makes a double negative. And in the Greek, that's called emphatic negation. And that means no, under no circumstances, absolutely not. No, and don't try to change my mind because I really mean it. And that's what Jesus was saying. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise, under no circumstances, I will absolutely never throw him out. Okay, good deal. Thanks for the warning. Again, he used that term. John 10, 28, I, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, never perish, never perish, never perish, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Okay, I'm uh, finished now. Bob says our time is up. Does anybody have a question that I can fi uh, forward to Bob <laughs> <laughs> or a comment? Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, may God bless all of us as we continue to, to learn and to grow.